Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Let's Get Vulnerable podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan, and we have a very special guest with us, the one and only Rachel Luna. Welcome, Rachel. Hello, Dr. Morgan. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here. Of course, of course. And you all may know her as Girl Confident on Instagram. And I just want to do a quick intro of Rachel. So you know how incredible she is here. So Rachel is a best-selling author, sales confidence and mindset strategist. She's a highly sought after international speaker. She's a former U S Marine and she's four feet, 11 inches tall, but a firecracker. And she has a reputation for inspiring confident action. And she can help her clients double, triple and quadruple their income. And she's the host of the Permission to Offend podcast, which y'all, I have been binging and I absolutely love. So make sure you check that out. And we are just so, so lucky to have Rachel today. Welcome to the Let's Get Vulnerable podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Permission to Offend. I my baby. It's my latest baby. So (laughs) Rachel, I love it. I feel, uh, when I listen to it, that you and I have such a similar mission in just being totally authentic and you, and in yours, when when you start in your intro, you say, let's get offensive, which I love (laughs) in mine. I say, let's get vulnerable. (laughs) So it's like this alignment there. I love it. But isn't vulnerability offensive to some people? Yes. That's what I was so, thinking about. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's anytime we are our truest, authentic self, someone is offended. It is so true. So you might as well just embrace it. Do you think that that is what stops a lot of people from stepping into their true selves is that they worry about those people they're going to offend? They worry about offending others and they worry about being judged. Because yeah. if they're judged, if we open ourselves up for judgment, then we're opening up, opening ourselves up for the potential of rejection and failure. And nobody wants that. I cannot think of a person who wakes up saying, Man, I can't wait to get rejected today. I can't <laughs> wait to fail. Although some of us, and I include myself in this group of people, some of us are okay being rejected. Mm -hmm. Some of us are okay failing. It's not the desire, Mm -hmm. but it's a knowing that every rejection is almost like a form of protection. And, you know, there's that cliche rejection is just redirection. Uh, No, sometimes rejection is not redirecting you to go another way. It's testing you to see are, do you believe in what you want so much that you're willing to go back into the fire and see if you can get out alive this time? And I'm reading, my friend Jamie Kern Lima has a new book coming out called Believe It. I got an advanced copy. And it is so incredible to see and read how many times she was rejected and reject. I mean, she's like a professional mm. reject. Mm. And yet she went on to be the first female CEO of L'Oreal in 150 years. She sold her company, It Cosmetics, to them for 1.5 billion, billion with the B dollars. And that only came to pass because she allowed herself to continuously be reject, be in a position to be rejected. So, and by the way, it was offensive to the people in the boardrooms mm-hmm. that she kept pitching, you know, because mm-hmm. I don't know about if this has ever happened to you, but do you get pitched for guests to be on your show? Oh, constantly. All the time, right? Mm-hmm. And there it's pitches from people who have never even listened to the show. They would be a terrible fit mm-hmm. and they just keep on and keep on and yep. keep on pitching. And I know that I get annoyed. Like if you pitch me one more time, <laughs> girl, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right. Yes. I'm offended. Yes. Uh, stop, stop pitching me, but good on them. Yeah. They're good trying on them because they're trying. And even though I may never say yes, who knows? They might come, they, the pitch might modify ever so, so gently. And yeah. can I say one thing too? Um, I, I jokingly said, I'm offended with all these pitches. I'm actually not because one of the things that I have also worked on 
is increasing my capacity to be offended. Yes. So when people do offensive things, I ha- I'm not desensitized to it. I have increased my, my tolerance level. Mm-hmm. So you can be offensive around me. And rather than me taking it as a personal attack or being offended, I get curious. Well, what yes. did you mean by that? What you trying yes. to say? <laughs> Exactly. And, you know, I think sometimes it's just data that maybe that relationship isn't really meant for you. Like that person is not part of your tribe. Right. And the most attractive thing is when we are our true selves, our authentic selves. And then that's Mm -hmm. like a magnet for the people who belong in your life. Right. Yeah. And also we have to be really careful when we're casting that net to attract people and recognizing that when people reject us, it is really probably the best thing that they could do for us in that moment. And I'll give you an example. I had a client who was launching and she was like, I want X amount of people. And it was, she was very emotionally attached to the number of people. So I said, great, well, let's look at the email sequence. You know, we did all the sales stuff, the marketing piece that I know to do. And she hit the goal and it, was the worst experience for her. Mm. It was all the wrong people. And I remember or like one week into her delivering the program, she sends me a message. She's like, I hate these people. They're the worst. They're not good. They're not this, they're not that. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, as a good coach, I didn't come down with the told you souls or anything like that. I tried to help her troubleshoot to, to make it work because mm-hmm. sometimes there are going to be moments in life where we should have been rejected, but we're not. We get a seat at the table or the people come into the program or the relationship gets strong, you know, mm-hmm. survives the breakup. Um, and now we have to follow through. And so how do you follow through in an uncomfortable situation where you know that it's going to be better for you to just follow through and get through this patch than mm-hmm. it is to dismantle everything? So that's important as well. Kind of rambled there, but I think. No, no, it's a, it's a good point. I, I certainly know that's happened to me in different commitments and I very much have built up the trust within myself that I do what I'm saying, that I do what I say I'm going to do. Right. So sometimes I have found myself in scenarios where I owed it to myself to check in the alignment a Mm -hmm. bit more before I committed to this, right? And this is why it is so important to build that practice of checking in with yourself of what, what aligns and am I with this person, with this contract, with this job, am I my true self in this environment or am I, you know, stunting who I really am? Yeah. And I think that the pause is the challenge because we live in this society of instant gratification and we're addicted to the serotonin and the dopamine hits that we get from social media. So when we're not getting that quick response, our amygdala sends this alarm, like something's not right. Um, That's why for people that are not used to meditating or standing still, those first 30 seconds can be like agony because you don't know what to do. You are in a vulnerable state of danger. But what if you could learn how to be in a dangerous environment without getting killed, right? I think, have you ever done cryotherapy? Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> yes. That's a perfect example. First time I ever did cryo, I remember, so if for anybody that's never done cryotherapy, you go into this chamber and, and the ones that I've done, it's a full body chamber. You, your head is cut everything. And you're in there basically naked, except for your hands and your feet. Um, you wear these little sock gloves and, and socks. And you've got your you know, bra and panty, of course, but everything else you're exposed. And you go into this sub freezing, like negative 140 degree temperature for three minutes. And every, I don't know how your people do it, but at my place, like every 30 seconds, they tell you to rotate. Otherwise mm-hmm. you'll get like frostbite. And the first time I remember going in there, that cold air just hits you in your face and it literally takes your breath away. And I remember thinking like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. I'm going to die in this thing. 
-hmm. And I had to tell myself, nobody dies from three minutes in the cold. Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to die. You need to just get control right now Mm -hmm. and figure out how do you enjoy this? So for me, I discovered that I had to cup my hands to my mouth and, and allow myself to breathe in warm air, right? That creates warm air. And that gave my body a sense of normalcy. Why am I telling you this? Because I want every single one of us to look at those moments in our day that create discomfort and fear, like, oh my gosh, and figure out what you need to do in that moment so that you can remind yourself that you're safe while you're still doing the uncomfortable thing. Because once you start breathing in that warm air, it changes the whole experience. And then you get out of the chamber, you feel like a freaking champion. I know I walk out there like, yeah, I'm the yes, champion. Yes, yes. <laughs> I love this so much. I love it so much, right? Because all throughout our day, we all have different things that would trigger us into a fight or flight mode. Mm-hmm. And, and what we know is that that is exhausting when, when you're constantly staying in that mode and you're not learning how to control it. Um, the, the women I work with and helping them finally have great relationships, healthy relationships, it's learning how to do that when they're triggered within a relationship. Oh, let's talk about that. Let's do it. Let's talk about that. Right. Here's what I've discovered. Um, I don't talk too much about my marriage because my husband is a very, very private person, but I know he's not going to listen to the show. So we're safe. So don't tell him if you ever meet him in person, <laughs> we talked about this. Anyway, so, um, we've been together for mm, like 13 years now, maybe, maybe a little more. I don't even know. Um, and we've had our ups and downs and both of us have hurt each other in different ways over the years. Mm. And now we're praise God in a much better place. But I remember that there were these, this season where he would do something, it would just be like the minor thing, but it would take me back to when we were in a really toxic part in our marriage where I was hurt and I felt uh, rejected and I felt um, uh, underappreciated and all of those things. And so what I've learned over the years is that every now and again, something will trigger. Like if my husband is too serious on any given day, for a split moment, I'm taken back seven years ago. Mm. And then I have to stop and remind myself, like, this isn't seven years ago. He's just serious because he's thinking his own thing. Ooh, this is so good. Relax. You and haven't Ra- done anything. Yeah. And Rachel, for the audience, this also applies to a past relationship, right? So oh. if you're out in the dating world and The new person you're dating, they happen to do a little thing, you know, that reminds you of an ex where that relationship ended horribly. You can have the same thing, right? Whether it's one relationship or guy. Yeah, exactly. Not the same guy. And here's Mm -hmm. where we have to take 100% personal accountability. I think that if we're going to have really great, healthy relationships, we have to take accountability for our response. Yes. uh, Our reaction, our thoughts. So when my husband does things um, that, you know, send me back or when even like sometimes we're watching TV and like a scene on TV will like trigger us both. um, I just stop and and ask myself, like, how do I want to be in this moment? What is true? What is real? So for the woman that is dating a new man, Mm -hmm. just stop and ask yourself, what is real right now? Who am I with? Why am I with this person? Mm -hmm. How are they different? And how am I going to respond? Because our response then sets in motion whether this is going to be diffused or whether it's going to be escalated. So if I look at my relationship with my husband, I'm I'm like a fun, I want everything to be fun all the time. So when people are too serious around me, it, it like messes up my nervous system, right? That's not their issue. That's my issue. I need to work on that, right? So if my husband is in his one of his serious faces, I then have to check how I'm going to respond to him. 
Am I going to ask him? And this is where, as women in particular, we need to stop making assumptions for what yes. they're thinking. Amen. Because I used to make an assumption that he was serious because I did something or he was mad or whatever. Mm -hmm. And after years and years, I finally learned, no, he has a thinking face. He's just lost in his own thoughts. <laughs> so I go and I'll ask him, do you need anything? What you're thinking about? Do you need some time by yourself? Do you need quiet time or do you want me to hang out? Right. And if he says, no, I'm just thinking, then let him think, give yes. him that time. It's yes. not, it's not a reflection of me. It's not a rejection. He's think, I mean, if we would just pause for a moment and mm -hmm. put ourselves in their shoes, and ask, how, do, how would I want them to respond? Now, if I'm thinking, if I'm concentrated in work and I've got my serious face and my husband comes in and he's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm just thinking. And he keeps on, well, you look serious. Well, you look mad. Shut mm. the fuck up, I'm working. So, right. You know what no, I mean? You're good, yeah. I, so, I love this so much, Rachel. I really do. This is one of the things I teach women. I call it reality testing. We, mm -hmm. we check in with the reality. And mm -hmm. there's a, there's a really helpful phrase, which maybe you've heard this one, but it's the story I'm telling myself is, yep, yep. and you're taking ownership of the narrative that you have. And yes. so often as, you know, people in a relationship, the story we're telling ourselves is confirming whatever model we mm -hmm. have about relationships. Maybe in the past you had a parent who didn't pay attention to you or who abandoned you at one point. Mm -hmm your current narrative then is going to line up with that past model, unless you pause and you check in with the reality. Yeah. I call it separating the truth from the stories, right? To pull out Ooh, the facts. Good. Yes. Pull out the facts. That's chapter one of my book, permission to offend. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you can't I love buy it. it. Yet, but, um, but no, that's where it's, 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 examining the facts, pulling out the story. And also yes. I think it's our responsibility. Once we learn these kind of strategies to teach them to our partner, because yes. really productive conversations. I remember one time my husband and I were driving somewhere and he tells me to turn on the navigation, which is like already a miracle, right? Cause you know, men in the navigation. Yeah. So <laughs> I tell him, babe, at the light, you're going to make a left. Mind you, that morning had already been tense with the kid. Everybody was already like pissed off when we got in the car. So we're starting off, but I'm like, let me just be cool. So I say, hey, babe, you got to turn left at the next light. And we're getting closer to the light and he's not inching over. And I'm like, you got to turn left at the light. He's ignoring me completely, saying nothing. And all of a sudden I lose it. And I say, you know what? Let's just go home. If you're gonna ignore me, I don't even know why you tell me to do that. I, I don't know what I said, but I just went off. He pulls, he goes, one of those like quick cuts over. And he goes, I was gonna go straight because I drive this road every day and he makes the excuse. So we start arguing and I'm like, well, why didn't you say that? You're just ignoring me. You only ignore me. That's all you ever do. And I said, you don't forget it. Let's just go home. Right. So it's getting tense in this car. We go home. He like peels into the driveway. I slam the door. I tell the kids, get out of the car. Go to your room. You know, everybody's pissed. Right. Yeah. A couple of hours pass by and the whole time I'm stewing in this. Mm. And I'm thinking, I really want to stay mad because I'm hurt mm. because this is not the first time. And I'm telling myself a story that he thinks I'm stupid. He thinks I'm dumb. He thinks that he doesn't have to listen to me, right? So all the stories. So I recognize this, Morgan. I have this clear moment, of, but I go in there and I say, listen, I'm telling myself a story that either one, you think I'm stupid or two, you don't listen to me. So which one is it? First of all, <laughs> don't do that. World right? War Three. <laughs> don't do that. 
Um, because when we do that, right, that's still, we're telling ourselves a story, mm -hmm. but now I've given him an ultimatum. Mm -hmm. Which one is it? You gave him some bad options. <laughs> right. So he says, well, first of all, let me stop you right there because you are telling yourself stories now, but wait, why could he say that to me? Because I taught him what we're telling ourselves stories, you know, yeah. both of us. Are, so he mm -hmm. understands the language. And so he comes back at me. He says, you are telling yourself stories and this little ultimatum that you gave me, you want me to pick between two things that are not true. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're stupid. And I do listen to you. He said, but when I don't respond, it's because I'm thinking and I think slower than you do. So in my mind, I am answering you. It's just the words haven't like, you know, so mm. we went, we were able to work through it but I share all that for a couple of reasons. Number one is that when you are dissecting your own stories and the story that I'm telling myself is, and you want to share this story, it's totally fine to say, I'm thinking this, these are the stories I'm thinking this, I'm thinking this and stop right there. Don't mm -hmm. come out with this ultimatum of which one of my stories is true because none of our stories could be true as mm -hmm. was the case with me. And then the second point is, teach your, we teach people how to treat us. Yep. So if you teach your partner, um, nonviolent communication, the way that you teach your, you know, your clients, mm -hmm. then we're going to have better relationships. And also don't be afraid to go into the fire of having an uncomfortable conversation. Don't you think sometimes we try to avoid the hard conversations because oh, we don't yeah. want to cause, you know, we don't want to rock the boat. Yeah. But I think sometimes you do have to rock the boat, right? You, do. You, have to, you have to shake things up. And and while you're rocking the boat, things that don't belong in the boat are going to get out. Yep, exactly. I, I love everything you're saying, of course. And I think um, one of the things I always tell people is curiosity is a relationship superpower where instead of assuming, just as you've said, right, mm -hmm. you're so, so curious about your partner's experience and, and where they're at and what's really going on for them. Yes. If you can approach the conversation with that energy, of course, people who feel heard are going to then listen to you. Yes. So, so many of us want to just say what we want to say, and then that's it. But you have to be curious in order for then you to be listened to. Yeah. You know, you said something interesting about listening. One thing that I learned, can't remember, years ago is the concept of always listening. And we're listening so that we can respond. Right. And we need to start listening so that we can understand. Yeah. So often we're listening to see like, well, what's my next statement? You know, how am I going to come back to this? rather than listening, am I really understanding what my partner is saying to me? Can I empathize with where they're coming from? Yes. I love that. I love that so much. It's so important. Slow it down. I always, you know, I'll tell my, my women like slow down the conversation. Um, and that's how you really connect. Yeah. I want to share something with you. Cause I feel like you're going to love it too. This is something I teach. I talk about relationship culture and every, every relationship has a culture and you absolutely have the right to show up in it and help co-create the culture, which yeah. is what you're talking about of teaching your partner, the nonviolent communication and, and showing up, you know, I think so many women just want to have the relationship. They don't want to rock the boat. So, yeah. so they don't want to co-create the culture. Yes. That's a really good, I love that. The relationship culture. Um, there's a new app called clubhouse. Have you heard of it? I haven't. It's an, it's a new app. It's like audio only, but, um, that makes me think of how we, some of us that whenever we invite someone to the platform, we teach them how to work through the whole thing. And we tell them like, this is the culture. This is how you clap for people. This is what you want to pay attention to. And it's so interesting. Uh, I would say that that would be so good, even like with our family, with our children. Mm -hmm. I love that concept. Yeah. yeah. Being, be intentional. 
be intentional mm-hmm. about the culture, you know, so hopefully part of your relationship culture is open, honest, healthy conversations, and also a culture where you welcome those tough conversations, yeah. right? Where it's just normal. Yeah. It's and what, what about, you yeah. What about also releasing the need to be right? Oh yeah. That I think is a, that should be part of everybody's relationship culture is like, it's okay for me to be wrong. Yes. And for you to be right. Like I don't have yes. to win every argument. It's not a competition. You're on, you're on the same team. We're you're on, on the, the same, same team. team. Come on. Like, we're both the MVP. Yes. Right. Like, (laughs) um, because that makes a difference too. In particular, once you graduate from the, we're just dating to now we're dating and we are procreating and we have children because that is a whole other ball game of Mm -hmm. concessions that you have to make. And, you know, we're raised differently and, you know, I, that's not how I want to raise my kids. Well, this is how I'm going to raise them. And, and coming to this middle ground of how do we co-parent together? And if you say yes to the kids on something that I'm a hundred percent against, like, how do we navigate through that? Yeah. So you got to release your need to be right a lot. Yes. Yes. And I feel like having the intentional conversations about what are your values? How, how do you want things to be prioritized? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, they don't have those relationship contracts and I don't really like the word contract, maybe more of like an agreement. Agreement. Yeah. Yeah. A shared agreement where you're co-creating. A lot of people aren't intentional about that. And they're just kind of passively showing up in their relationships, you know? Well, I think though, it's also a a matter of sticking with the boundaries because sometimes mm-hmm. you, I mean, I know, for example, my husband and I, we've talked about some things with our kids and we both agree, like, this is how it is. This is what we're going to do. This is it. And then the kids will come in and put like a little face and the boundary gets broken. Mm-hmm. And so it's making sure that you have good, solid agreements and strong boundaries. Yes. And and that you have the ability to have a conversation when a boundary has been breached. And how do we get back into integrity with what we said we were going to do and honor? Yeah. And it's a living, breathing agreement, right? You have to allow for the, you know, it's going to change. It's like, so (laughs) that's why I always tell couples, you know, if, if your relationship was like a business, right? Like you don't just have like one meeting a year to run a business. You are checking in, you are finding out what works, what doesn't work. It is that it's just part of how you can have that relationship where people's needs are getting met. Yeah. Well, cause we're, we should all be evolving as the years progress, right? We should be changing to some extent. We should. It's, it's, you should want your partner to change. Yeah. We get lazy and we go, oh, I just want to understand you as you are. So I just know how everything's supposed to be. Yeah. But, but no, in that really healthy, connected relationship, you know your partner is evolving, your partner is growing, and that requires the relationship to grow and change. Hopefully, you're growing together. Together. I think that that's go- going to your point about intentionality is recognizing when you're both growing and you're starting to grow diff in different ways. Mm -hmm. I think that right there, as soon as you start to see that, that divergence happening, have a meeting and say, Hey, cool that you're into this and I'm into this. Let's find something that we're both into as well. So we can have a thing together because otherwise, um, you know, you become two strangers living in the same house. Yes. That's such a good point. Such a good point. There's three, three entities, there's each individual, and then there's the relationship and you have to look at, okay, what's feeding the relationship, right? Yeah. You have to feed the individuals, but also how how do we take care of the relationship? You know, what else I see can be a challenge. Um, And I don't know if, if a lot of your, your ladies are entrepreneurs, but when one is an entrepreneur and your partner like wants nothing to do with your business and or, or personal development and here you are bettering yeah. yourself and, 
and they're not getting better the way that you want them because you've gone to some event and you've seen this very enlightened guy oh, get up on stage and you know, oh my gosh I, I have to tell this story real quick tell it okay so I used to date someone years ago years ago back in in San Diego um and he was a musician which I love music but he really just was lacking motivation in the way that that I had motivation mm -hmm. so he was out till 3 a.m he might have not had a job at certain times, like, you know, very different paths. I'm over here getting my doctorate in clinical <laughs> psych. I go to Tony Robbins <laughs> <laughs> while I'm in this relationship and I come back and he couldn't stand me, could not stand the way that I had changed. And mm -hmm. that was one of those clear signs of this is out of alignment. Yeah. We may be great individuals, but the, the couple doesn't yeah. function with, with the, these values being so different. Yeah. And also there are moments where you genuinely love the part, like, cause yeah. I have, I have had that experience too, right. Where like, I've gone to something and I come back and here's my husband, a Marine. He's not changing. He's not making these leaps and bounds in personal development. Right. Yeah. But I'm developing. Um, and I'm, I think that sometimes women think like, well, I've grown and they're not growing. So we need to get a divorce and that I just want to talk to that woman right now. Yeah. Like if he's listening, like you don't have to get a divorce. Like don't throw the baby out with the yes. bathwater. Yes. If you really love this man mm -hmm. and you guys are just growing in different ways, that's Okay. Focus on your business. Stop trying to bring him into your business. Stop trying to force each other into things that you're not interested in and go back to the basics. Find out what you are interested in together and, and really build on that. And then you do your Tony Robbins and yes. your whatever's and, and let him do his golfing and his beer or whatever. Absolutely. And don't feel this pressure to like get rid of something just because you're not 100% on the same page. Absolutely. I could say so much about this. I love that you're talking about this because that need to have everything the same and to be totally, you know, it's, it actually is a representation of codependency, right? Of we, of, we need to be the same. There's this term called confluence of you and I need to be the same. And it's actually fueled by insecurity and fear of abandonment. Mm. So, so if you notice yourself like, oh, well, they're, they're doing this and I'm doing this and I just want to leave. It's a, it's a protective response. Cause you're actually afraid that you're going to be abandoned. Oh, I did not know that that's good. So take a look at that, right? Like you, you do, you want your partner to have their individual Yes. you know, things they're pursuing. And if, if you're that, you know, female entrepreneur and you're pursuing it and your partner doesn't want anything to do with it, it's okay. Mm -hmm. The, the caveat is as long as they're not putting you down and saying, right. You shouldn't, right. Then right. it's like, get no. out of there, girl. <laughs> right. Absolutely. But <laughs> Don't stay in a toxic, right. abusive environment. Relationship. Right. But if they're the just not, if they're just not interested, that's okay. Let mm -hmm. them be not interested. And then here, I know you'll, you'll uh, definitely resonate with this, but do the work, show up, do the thing, use the actions mm -hmm. before you're talking about it and telling yes. them all about it. Just go do it. Yes. yes. They'll, yes. they'll get on board once you do it. Once you show a result, they're in. Like yeah. I remember, so my husband, um, he, he was like lukewarm on board, right? Like kind of on board, not on board. And then after a couple of years, maybe like the first years, I kept saying like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But like things weren't really happening. Mm -hmm. So then he was like, you keep talking about this business. It created a lot of tension and friction. So then I did just like you said, I stopped talking about it because yeah. it would create a lot of fights or create a lot of arguments, a lot of resentment. And I just stopped talking about it. And I just started doing, and I remember one day I made $15,000, um, on a, in like a two and a half, three week little 
promotion that I was doing and it was more money than he was making a month. And I said, look, we made $15,000. That was where things began to change. I love it. That year, um, I ended up, I can't remember. I remember he said something like, you made more in a week than I make in a month. And that was where things really began to change. Now, that's not to say like you should be on a mission to out perform or out earn your partner. But the point is like when you start to show results, all of a sudden their tolerance for whatever your dream requires expands, the capacity increases. Exactly. I love it. And this could be with anything. It could be with, okay, I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to start working out. I'm going to, you know, oh, I've decided I'm going to eat a different way instead of talk, 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 do the thing, let them, let them see how you change and how you feel better. Be, be the light. Yep. Right. And then they, they might be interested in it. Yeah. They just might. Right. Like, exactly. So that's, yeah. I love the story, Rachel. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, your husband is a lucky guy, of course, to have have you. I'm pretty great. You know, you talked about agreements in the beginning. We had a really silly agreement in the beginning of our our marriage. Ready for this one? I want it. Yeah. It was um, neither one of us could gain or lose more than 10 pounds because our whole, well, I mean, remember we were former Marine. We were Marines at the time. He just retired. I got out a couple of years ago. And so in the Marine Corps appearance, size, shape, all of that matters. And he was like, don't you come and, you know, gain all this weight. And I said, well, I'm looking at you too, buddy. Don't, don't switch out a representative (laughs) with some, you know, retiree or whatever. So we had this funny joke. Well, here we are 13 years later and I'm like 30, I weigh 30 pounds less than I did when we first married, because I got, you know, breast cancer last year and the treatments and everything like that. And I have, you know, half of one tit and is there and and the other half is not. Um, And I lost all my hair, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I had this huge physical change and he just retired and homeboy has gained like, I don't know, the 30 that I lost. Oh, honey, we better hope he's not listening now. <laughs> we joke about it. We joke about it. Okay. He, okay. I, we, he's got like hair on his face, like a wolverine. Like, mm. you know, we don't look yeah. like we did when we were kids. Right. And it's so funny because I love him and I don't care. That's that beautiful. He, I don't even, I don't even care if he loses the weight. If he's happy, great. Like, I laugh. I buy him donuts. I buy him whatever, whatever is going to make him happy. I just, I want to see him happy and he wants to see me happy. And I want to share that because I think sometimes we get really caught up in you're not this, you're not that you don't look the certain way. You don't do this. You don't do that. And it's like, if you just pair all of that, when you are sick, is this person going to take care of you? Ooh, gives me goosebumps. When you are up against the wall, are they going to have your back, right? A couple of weeks ago, I had a really, I was having a really bad healing reaction from my treatments and Mm. I was in so much pain and I was crying and it was like one in the morning and I I couldn't take it anymore. And I woke up my, my daughter and I said, go get daddy. Oh, fun fact. Like, eight out of 10 days in a row, we sleep in different beds. Mm -hmm. Um, We like it. Yeah. (laughs) I talk to a lot of couples that like that. I get it. We like it. People move around a lot, you know? (laughs) So I, I, I had, he was in another room and I had him come and I was like, I'm sorry. I just, I can't take the pain anymore. And he's like, what do you need? And I was like, I need a, I need an enema. I I do coffee enemas every Mm -hmm. day. And by the way, like, that's the most unsexy thing, right? When I first met my husband, I used to tell him, I don't, you can't be in the house when I go to the bathroom. 
I don't have a colon. You will never like all of that, right? Because I want to be sexy, but now here I've I got sick and coffee mm-hmm. enemas are part of my daily thing. Wow. So I am po- I poop like three, four times a day. And everybody in the house knows that this is happening, right? It's horrible. <laughs> but anyway, the point is like at one in the morning, this man is up there making the this concentrate that I need so that I can do this treatment. I love this. I mean, that's it, love. it's love. And it, it just makes me think about all the things that we confuse as love. Love mm-hmm. gets confused for so many things. Yes. We are not our physical bodies, right? Like, let's start there. Like, it's a it's a spiritual connection when, when you really love someone you're you're in love with who they are at their at their core at their know? worst you love them and, at their yeah, worst at their worst exactly because you you genuinely selflessly want the best for them yeah. and you you see them you love them at your worst at their worst and you can also see them at their best yes yes right? yes so good Thank you for sharing that, Rachel. That, that's a beautiful example of the evolution of a relationship of starting with that agreement and then getting to the place where it doesn't matter. You know, you, yeah. you have that full acceptance. Wouldn't you say, and I, I'm curious about this, that that full acceptance of the other is also the product of the full acceptance of yourself. A hundred percent. A hundred percent, because as soon as I stopped worrying about whether he was going to leave me or if I was good enough, then all of a sudden everything about him was good enough. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. It starts with you. Mm -hmm. I think that the more, and it goes back to your point about the codependency stuff, right? Like the more at peace I can be in my own company the the more at ease I know I know I'm going to be in his company and he's going to be in my company right if we feel and this was actually an old boyfriend help me figure this out (laughs) (laughs) this was the the first time I actually felt good about my body body image wise was with an old an old flame you know obviously more than a decade ago um I was always really self-conscious about my breasts. And I remember one time, like we were going to be intimate and I was covering, right. I was laying down and I was covering them because, you know, I don't know if you've ever had this, but when I lay down, my boobies go to the wind, right? Like the the Red Sea part. And I didn't want him to see that. So I, I did this and he moved my hands and I said, no, don't look at me. And he just like, he, he was like, I don't care, whatever. And, and just, he accepted that. Right. Mm. And I remember feeling good that I had been accepted in this vulnerable position, but then also feeling really disappointed that it took a man to accept me before I could accept myself. Mm. And so after that moment, I decided I'm never going to have my worth and my self-love be dependent on whether or not a guy accepts it. And that that was a big, big shift. And so what I started doing after that was the, the parts of my body that I was not pleased with, I, I would touch them the same way that this guy had touched, you know, the way he touched me and like Mm -hmm. loved on me. Mm -hmm. I started touching, like I used to have this like giant, um, the kangaroo pouch And I would um, just put my hands there and just say like, I love you. Mm. You are, you are good. You are life force. Mm -hmm. You know, you, and I would say things like, I know that you're big because you're making space because that, you know, you have to hold babies in there and you need the room. And, and I started saying all these positive things. Don't you know that that pouch started getting smaller and smaller? I don't even have a pouch anymore. I, Yes. Yes. That is ex- my thoughts. Exactly. When you can love something, you know, and our bodies are a great example, when you fully love and accept your body, mm-hmm. you then give it the energy to be at its most healthy state, but you cannot hate your body into 
a, a healthier way of being, right? Mm -hmm. So it starts with that love and you giving it to yourself. So powerful. So healing. It's yes. healing. And another thing is, I don't know if you've ever been accused of this, but I have been accused of being extra too much. Oh yeah. You're so extra. You're so extra. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was um, hanging out with a friend and I said, FYI, I'm about to be really extra right now. And um, he said, why do you always do that? I said, why do I always do what? He said, you always give disclaimers. Mm -hmm. You always like warn me that you're about to be extra. And I said, just so you could brace for impact. Cause I'm coming in hot. Like, I don't want you to be taken by surprise. <laughs> And he was like, yeah, but I like that. Like, that's mm -hmm. why I hang out with you because you're fun. And that the extra part of you is like, that's the fun part. Mm -hmm. And that always stuck with me because at, sometimes we think that the parts of us that are the most unbecoming, those are the things that are the most attractive to the people that we really enjoy being around the most. So true. I just wrote it down. Don't give disclaimers for who you really are mm -hmm. because that I, it's just so powerful because also then you're planting it in that person's head, right? That there's and, something, oh, wrong, there's with something that. wrong. Yeah. So it's all about, yeah, you, I mean, that's kind of full circle where we started of you being <laughs> your authentic self. And that's going to bring those people to you who love you as yep. you are. And God, it's exhausting if we're trying to show up as a different version of ourselves all the time. I, I, I used to be a chameleon in my old, my old self and my old relationships. You know, I would feel like I had to be a different person around different people and it would be exhausting. Cause then what if I'm hanging out with all those people at once that I'm trying to like be a <laughs> different person, you know, no, like I refuse, you know, I've refused to do that now for, for yeah. a long time. So that's interesting. I, I went through that, that as well in past for like, yeah, it's kind of like the runaway bride, you know, where she didn't know what kind of eggs she liked. I, yes. I love that movie. I so related to her in that. Yeah. Oh, and it's, Richard Gere. Yeah. Oh, it's a good classic. Good. Yeah. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> Rachel, well, I wanted to ask you one thing that's been on my mind just kind of before we wrap up. I've been thinking a lot about seasons mm. and, and the spiritual meaning of seasons. And I know, you know, we're, we're moving into winter, but also just as a world right now, we've mm. been going through this, this season of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, for, for me, I think about when we go through winter, which is hardship, mm -hmm. it's that opportunity to really grow and become, become stronger. It's an opportunity to rest, mm -hmm. to heal, to take stock of mm -hmm. our strengths and our growth areas. Um, but what about for you, when you think about this concept, what, what comes up for you? Well, one thing that I've always said about seasons is that it's a wonderful opportunity to do our purpose work. And what I mean by that is that many times people look at, at their purpose and they'll say like, I don't know my life's purpose. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we don't have one life purpose. I believe that we have seasonal purpose and the the seasonal purpose is the culmination of all our seasons together make our life purpose. So as we're in this season right now that for some people has been dark, heavy, depressing, um, overwhelming, for other people, it's been a chance of respite and rest and recovery and assessment. So as we're sort of going into winter here in the United States, because some parts of the world are going into summer right now. Mm. Hey, Australia, I see you. <laughs> but um, as we are going into the physical winter, um, one thing I like to remember is that every season has an end, right? Mm -hmm. And even 
I, I know someone was saying like, well, no, not San Diego. It's always 65. <laughs> well, actually that's not true anymore, right? If we look at how the world is changing, yeah. places that never had snow are now getting snow. You know, flowers that never grew in places are now growing. Mm -hmm. And so if you can remember that the world as a whole is constantly evolving, I wanna invite you to think about for this season right now, this winter, who do you want to be when the spring comes, right? When you can finally walk freely out of your house without a mask or whatever, who do you want people to see? How do you want to show up? And you can't wait for the spring to get here to then be that person. You have to embody that now. You have to develop those habits now. You have to put into practice those systems and processes now. So I invite you to look at all areas of your life, right? Starting with your relationship. When it's summertime and you are out on the beach and the whatevers, right? Like, how do you want to be enjoying that time with your partner? Well, that the things that you do in the summer are predicated by how you've prepared in the winter. Mm -hmm. How good Absolutely. you feel laying on the beach mm -hmm. is the product of the work that you did in the winter. Yep. So look at that and just assess in every area in your relationships, in your business, in your finances. You know, like you were mentioning, taking stock, assessing, mm -hmm. and giving yourself the permission to make incremental changes each day, you know, and here's the other thing, condition yourself for a daily pattern of victory. Yeah. Because if you do that now in the darkness, when you're in the light, wow, you're, you're nothing's going to block your shine. Right. And here's what I mean. Sometimes we have a to-do list that is like miles long and we're like, I'm going to get all these things done. And at the end of the day, you've gotten done one or two things. You look at your list and you feel like crap because, <clears throat> excuse me, you thought you could do more than you did. You feel like a failure. So I want to encourage you to flip that around and pick only one or two things to do per day that are, that you're going to be commit your commitment. And by the way, if you are someone who struggles with self-integrity, then I want your commit, I want to invite you to have a commitment list that is really easy. Like I'm going to take a shower every day. I'm going to something dumb yes. that like would be easy to Start do. Small. Start really small because then that condition that creates brand new neural pathways in your brain and your brain starts to believe, oh, I'm a winner. I can do this. Yep. Then start incrementally and, and remind you, remember that in order to achieve the big goal, the little details are what make that happen. Mm -hmm. So use this time of quote unquote darkness to knock off the little things because the spring is right around the corner and it's going to come faster than we think. Amen to all of that. I love it. It's so true. So, so true. I love what you said about building self-integrity. Yeah. You know, you do have to be able to trust yourself first before you trust the world and you trust others. Yeah. So, so important to take that assessment. Can Could I trust I myself? Say one more, one more last thing too. Yeah. Um, anchor into what you believe, anchor into the belief, right? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that this is a season? Yes. Because if you don't believe that this is a season, none of the other things that we talked about doing, like the tactical things, those are not going to help you. The Amen. first step is like, figure out what you believe. Like, I believe we're going to get through this. I yes. believe that it won't be long now. I'm, I'm a woman of faith. So I have all the faith in the world that we're going to come out of this on the other side better because I have that belief. Now I'm backing it up with actions that I'm proving to myself what I believe is true through my actions in this season. Absolutely. You need the belief as the anchor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was picturing like people who have the belief of, oh, you know, we're in a downward spiral. Things will never get better. I'm like, pick, you know, picturing them with like a 
snow machine and like everything's better, but they're creating the winter, right? Like they're yes, finding ways they to are. still make winter. So don't be one of those people, like really get clear on your beliefs. Our, our well, beliefs create our also, reality. Yeah, they do. But also like, don't just get clear on your beliefs. Also like look for other stories to back up your belief, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, the Bible says that our faith is increased by hearing. So look, listen for other people's stories, right? This is why it's so important for every single one of us to tell our story, to yeah. tell about the things that we've overcome because that increases other people's faith. I was talking to my girlfriend today. Her, um, her man is in the restaurant industry and she was like, and by the way, most people will say, what about the restaurant industry? It's taking a beating, it's collapsing, it's da, da 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 You know where they're going today? He's opening another little restaurant, another, I love it. another, he has multiples. He's opening another one and they're going to do a tasting today. And I said, how amazing that your man is prospering through the pandemic in, a, in an economy that people say has been devastated. The restaurant yep. industry has been devastated. This dude's opening up another restaurant. Yeah. Right. People Ooh. talk about the stock market. I'm up in yeah. March when the pandemic hit. I said, I'm buying stock because I know it's going to go down, but this is going to rebound. Millionaires are made in recessions. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Ooh. About all that, but oh, just Rachel, we have been so lucky to have you today. You. And I just want to acknowledge your energy. I know that the audience here is so going to appreciate every word you shared. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, how can people find you? They want, they want more girl if confident. You want more, definitely <laughs> subscribe to my podcast, Permission to Offend. It's where all the podcasts are streaming. It's really um, good, y'all. <laughs> uh, follow me on Instagram. I'm at girl confident and with the T at the end. And of course you can always go to rachelluna.biz and get on my mailing list and be friends. I love it. Thank you Thank so you. much. And I'm just wishing you and your family a wonderful holiday season. And Thank you. You too, yeah. friend. All right. And thanks everyone. As always, I'm wishing you high self-worth and great relationships. We'll talk with you soon.